Hi, this is Dame Pasty here with your weekly brush up of last week's episode, Blood of My Blood. Beyond the Wall. Mir is my new hero. I mean, that boy's gotta be heavy. Bran seems to be stuck processing all the downloaded vision data stuffed in his head from the last episode. There's lots of other videos out there looking at the visions that he had in detail, so I'll skip that. But the one thing I did notice was that the wildfire spreading through the hallways did not actually happen yet. So can we assume that it means it will happen in the future? Mira finally collapses from exhaustion. Bran wakes up, just as the running dead catch up to them. Then a masked rider appears, slicing and dicing and crisping the whites with the coolest, or should I say hottest, flail ever. And just when you think you're going to find out who he is, the bastages cut away to the next scene. Horn Hill Sam, Gilly, and the cutest little rug rat south of the wall arrive at his family's palatial estate. Actually, palatial might be an understatement. Here I was thinking that Sam's family was simply high cotton, and instead they're totally old money. Gilly finds out that Sam was less than honest about her origins, and you and I both know this waddling on the down low thing is not going to work. We finally meet Sam's mother and sister, and they are lovely, kind, and warm, just as Sam described them. Gilly looks like a deer caught in the headlights, which is exactly what it looks and feels like when an abused person meets nice, normal people. King's Landing It appears that Whittle Toman is worried about his wifey-wifey and tries talking to the high turkey again. And you gotta know something is up when the high bird all of a sudden decides Toman can see Marjorie. Then Marjorie tells Toman, Lord almighty, I've seen the light of the seven. Except that it's got to be an act. She's just desperate to save her brother. Toman falls for it because, well, he's Toman. Horn Hill. Gilly gets a makeover and she cleans up real nice. Sam's all googly-eyed over her and it's sweet. Next we cut that sweetness with some serious bitterness from Randall Tarley at the dinner table. Sam's dad shits all over him and Gilly stands up for him. Like the wild-ass wildling that she is and good on her. Sam's mom ain't putting up with it either, and she takes the ladies and leaves, an extra good on her. Now we know where Sam gets his quiet, dignified chutzpah from. After this show is over, I don't think I will ever be able to sit down to a dinner table without a sense of dread. Anyway, it's decided that Gilly and the baby can stay, but I don't think they're going to be treated very well. Apparently neither does Sam, because at first he says goodbye to Gilly, but then comes back right afterwards and says, No, screw this, you're coming with me. And then, showing some balls of steel, he takes the family Valyrian sword, Heartsbane. <laughs> Bravos. Arya is watching the actress trip again and seems to be the only one laughing at their portrayal of Joffrey's death until Lady Crane, her assassination target, does such a good job emoting grief at Cersei that Arya is actually moved. It's more than a little surreal to see Arya moved by a fake Cersei when she despises the real Cersei so much. While the play proceeds, Arya sneaks backstage to poison Lady Crane's rum, but afterwards runs into her. Lady Crane and Arya have a moment together, and Arya realizes, maybe a little too late, what a good person the actress is. Have no fear, though. Arya chooses to be the girl who believes in justice, which means she decided to remain Arya. She saves Lady Crane and exposes the envious young actress only problem is the waif chick saw the whole thing. Arya knows she's jumped into the deep end now, so she grabs her sword and finds a quiet place to hole up and wait. King's Landing Finally, we get to see a real confrontation between the crown and the high sparrow. Although, with the number of feathers on his armor, maybe Mace should be called the high sparrow instead. And psych! The writers have no intention of giving us some satisfying bloodshed. Instead, we see Jamie and the Tyrells get royally screwed over by the High Turkey again, when it's revealed that Toman has joined Marjorie in seeing the Light of the Seven. That dumb little shit made the church coequal with the crown. Incest babies have no sense whatsoever, do they? Unfortunately for Loras, we still don't know his fate, but I have some thoughts on this in the spoilers. Then, to add a cherry on top of the shit Sunday he just made Jamie eat, Toman fires him from the King's Guard and commands him to go help freaking Walder Frey retake River Run. The Twins Mr. Cranky Stabby is back in fine fettle. Walder Frey is busy yelling at his sons about having lost River Run to the Blackfish and telling them to go take it back whilst mistreating his barely pubescent bride. 
Walder brings out a surprisingly clean-shaven Edmure Tully as his ace in the hole. King's Landing Jamie goes to Cersei to whine about having to go help the hapless Freys, and she doesn't seem to care. She says she'll be fine with the mountain there. You would think that might hurt Jamie's feelings, but it doesn't faze him, and then they get all icky with their twin cess thing. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of Jamie still being so attached to Cersei. They need a falling out or something. Beyond the Wall Bran and Mir's rescuer is fixing a rabbit blood hot toddy for supper and reveals himself as undead Benjamin Stark. I mean, he's half dead now with a piece of dragon glass in his chest, but he still looks like a popsicle version of Benjamin, and clearly he remembers Bran. Essos. We take a long jump overseas to find Danny and Dario chit chatting on horseback when Danny decides she's going to go off by herself. Drogon appears, and holy Cheez-Its, he's gotten big. I got chills just seeing him fly over the Kalisar. And then Danny flies in on his back and gives a speech that seems completely unnecessary. Are they trying to show that she can call and fly Drogon now? If that's the point, it still didn't belong in this episode. And something about it made me uncomfortable, and that was purposely done. But again, her torch scene kind of showed that a couple of weeks ago, so why show us again? It just ne made no sense to me and threw me off at the end. Overall, my favorite bits were everything that happened at Horn Hill and the kick-ass entrance of Benjen. There's clearly a through line of family, which the title implies. We see the Starks coming back together and supporting one another, as has been the case this entire season. We see Danny further consolidating her family, and we see the Lannisters and their allies, the Tyrells and the Freys, continuing to fall apart. There is, however, another through line which was the concept of returning and possibly regressing. Benjen obviously fits a return. Jamie is forcefully regressed to being a regular old knight again. Arya returns to being herself, and Sam returns home and regresses briefly back to his old ways and Danny returns to an old promise. Basically, it was a decent episode that progresses the story forward and gives us some glimmers of hope. I'm still stoked for next week's installment, so I will see you then. Spoilers and Speculations 1. Loras will represent the Church in Cersei's trial by combat, and he will die. I don't think we will actually get Clegane Bowl now. I know the Hound is coming back soon, probably in the next episode, but I don't see him getting to King's Landing, finding a way to become acquainted with the High Turkey, and becoming the Church's camp champion in the time we have remaining. Besides, I would rather see him in the end game killing some Whites. 2. In the books, Jamie and Cersei are already done with each other, but show Jamie still very much involved with her. Jamie will go off to the Riverlands, not get River Run back, or at least only negotiate a peace settlement, which will piss off Cersei, who will then reject him via letter. That will be their big break. 3. The wildfire in the vision that we saw this episode is in the future. Cersei will burn down at a minimum the Sept, and possibly most of King's Landing with it. That's why the vision that Danny saw in the House of the Undying isn't one of snow, but of ashes. Jaime will have returned to King's Landing by that time, and he will try to stop her, end up killing her, or maybe he'll end up killing her afterwards. Either way, it will fulfill the book's prophecy that a Voloncar, younger brother, will kill Cersei. 4. Edmure was a real wimpy nothing before, and his uncle the Blackfish didn't seem very attached to him. I'm not so sure the Blackfish will end up caring what happens, but at the same time, family is incredibly important in this society, and Edmure is the last heir to the Tully lands, so maybe the phrase having him will make a difference, which will force the Blackfish to negotiate.